welcome to ATCM. I am Dr. Bharat and today we are going to go through acute myocardial infarction as a part of our EM Rapid 2022 series. In today's class, we are trying to um, go through the acute coronary syndrome, what is the definition and types of ACS, how a patient with myocardial infarction can present to you in emergency department, how to interpret the ischemic changes in the ECG and uh, what is the emergency management that has to be given to the patient from ER and of course some complication that is associated with MI. Now uh, the term ACS is applied to patients in whom there is a suspicion or confirmation of ongoing myocardial uh, ischemia that can or may not lead to infarction. So uh, for acute coronary syndrome the patient need not have infarction. There, there need to be evidence of ischemia only. Now, according to this uh, definition, ACS is divided into two major classifications. That is, one is unstable angina, where there is no infraction that is happening, and uh, there is um, MI, myocardial infarction, where there is uh, infraction. Myocardial infarction is happening due to the ischemia. Now, myocardial infarction is then divided into two subdivisions that is ST elevation MI and non ST elevation MI. So, basically, ST elevation MI and non ST elevation MI is being diagnosed with the use of ECG changes, uh, which is caused by the ischemia. Now, the 2018 Joint Task Force comprising the American Heart Association, the European Society of Cardiology, American College of Cardiology Foundation, the World Health Foundation uh, defined myocardial infarction myocardial infarction as the presence of acute myocardial injury presence of acute myocardial injury detected by an abnormal rise in the cardiac biomarkers in the setting of a acute myocardial ischemia so basically there should be a ischemia that is ongoing causing uh, myocardial injury and cell death uh, which in turn causes a rise in cardiac biomarkers like uh, cardiac enzymes uh, of CKMB and troponin INT. Now, coming to the basic pathophysiology of uh, myocardial infarction, the ACS is caused by a simple mismatch in the myocardial oxygen demand and the myocardial oxygen supply. Now, in MI, in mostly in ST elevation, MI, always in ST elevation MI and mostly in non ST elevation MI, the cause of acute uh, occlusion is usually the rupture of vulnerable plaque. So the atherosclerotic plaque that has a fibrous cap in the coronary arteries, if the fibrous cap is formed for um, rupture, uh, releasing the fire, uh, releasing the uh, fatty contents inside, that is called as a vulnerable plaque. And if that vulnerable plaque rupture is happening, that uh, rupture can attract. A thrombus formation on top of that causing either a complete occlusion or a partial occlusion of the artery. When there is a complete occlusion of the artery, we call it as ST elevation MI because there is complete occlusion uh, causing ischemia and infarction. When there is partial occlusion, there is still blood flow happening but is severely restricted causing uh, ongoing ischemia uh, but pro slowly progressive ongoing ischemia causing end stem. Now, NSTEMI can be caused by other mechanisms also. For example, other flow limiting conditions other than the acute occlusion can cause NSTEMI. For example, the progressive worsening of a stable plaque over time can cause NSTEMI. Severe vaso, uh, vaso constriction, severe vaso constriction, which is persisting for a long time, can cause NSTEMI. And coronary arteritis can also cause NSTEMI. Now, uh, other than the coronary arteries, the myocardium is itself can get uh, ischemic or infracted uh, due to direct cardiac injury like cardiac contusion, myocarditis secondary to infections or uh, autoimmune conditions and uh, uh, presence of cardiotoxic substances. Now, the some other mechanism that can also affect the blood flow to the heart uh, like a decreased myocardial um, perfusion can also cause enzyme. For example, a severe hypertension to the patient, patient in hypertensive emergencies causing inappropriate myocardial oxygen demand, patients in tachyarrhythmia causing increase in cardiac um, oxygen demand or causing decreased cardiac perfusion due to the poor outflow from LV. 
or even a pulmonary embolism. So uh, coming to ECG criteria for diagnosis of myocardial infarction, we have two set of criteria for diagnosing ST elevation MI as well as non-ST elevation MI. Before coming to that, we need to understand what is known as two contiguous leads. Contiguous leads. So contiguous leads are the leads that represent the same part of the heart in an ECG. So lead one and uh, lead ABL are contiguous leads. Lead two, lead three, lead AVF are contiguous leads. Uh, lead V1 to V6 are contiguous leads. So similarly, the left-sided ECG is the classical total lead ECG. We do have a right-sided ECG in which the V4, V5, V6 leads of the left side is being uh, switched over to the right side on the same anatomical position. And we do have posterior ECG in which those leads are being placed on the posterior part of the body rather than the anterior part of the body. So coming to the criteria, ST elevation MI is diagnosed when there is a new ST segment elevation at the J point of more than two or more contiguous leads with a cutoff value of more than one millimeter, except in V2 and V3. So that means that any new ST segment elevation of more than one millimeter uh, on more than one millimeter in uh, two contiguous leads other than V2 and V3, we can term it as ST elevation MI. In V2 and V3, we have a separate set of criteria depending on the age and the sex of the patient. So, male patients less than 40 years need a ST segment elevation equal to or more than 2.5 millimeter, while male patients of uh, 40 years or more than 40 years need a ST segment elevation of equal or more than 2 millimeter. And any woman, woman of any age, uh, requires ST segment elevation of more than 1.5 millimeters. Now, coming to the non-ST elevation MI. Non-ST elevation MI is diagnosed when there is a new onset horizontal or downsloping ST depression of more than 0.5 millimeter in two contiguous leads, and or or a T wave inversion of more than one millimeter in two contiguous leads in which those leads have a prominent R wave or a R wave to S wave ratio is more than one. Now, um, according to the leads that is affected in the ECG, we can fairly determine what the location of the ischemia that is happening in the heart. So, SC segment elevation or a Q waves in lead V1 to V6 and in lead 1 AVL has been traditionally been used to suggest anterior wall, anterolateral MI. Now, leads V1 and V2 more represent a septal area. So, if V1 V2 there is ST segment elevation, we can say that is a septal MI. V3, V4 are considered more indicative of apical region. V4 and V6 are more indicative of anterolateral infarction. Now, lead 2, 3 AVF suggests inferior wall MI and the right side leads, especially the, if we switch the V3, V4, V, uh, V5 and V6 to the right side, we have the right side V3 and right side VR uh, should uh, have, a, if at all they have ST segment elevation uh, or ST segment changes that denotes more of a right ventricular uh, involvement. Now, these two ECGs are uh, similar to what we have been uh, telling earlier. So, in here, in the first ECG, we can see that there is a bradycardia that is happening. It's a, a regular bradycardia uh, with, with deep Q, um, S waves in V1, V2, V3. And there is a ST segment elevation in V2, V3 and V4. Now there is a T wave on ST segment elevation along with there is a associated T wave inversion we can see in V2, V3 and V4. The ST segment and uh, T wave changes are absent in V5 and V6. Now coming to lead 1 and AVL, we do have a T wave inversion but there is no ST segment elevation as such but that can be early features. We, we may not get ST segment elevation in our leads in the same time itself. So, this ECG, uh, if this we take this as a first ECG, it has progressed to the second ECG here. In second ECG, we can see that the uh, one AVL is still normal only. There is no ST elevation there, but uh, the ST segments of V1, V2, V3 uh, and V4 have come down in amplitude in comparison to the V2, V3 and V4. Uh, the V2, V3 and V4 here, uh, the ST segment has come down in amplitude, but the R wave has completely disappeared from these leads especially in V2 and V3 and has formed a deep QS pattern which is classical of a Q wave MI.
Now, this ECG is basically showing a right sided ECG. We can see that uh, um, we have a ST segment elevation of uh, more than 1 millimeter in lead 2, lead 3, and AV of classical ST segment elevation. We can see. We can see the reciprocal changes to that ST segment elevation in lead 1 and lead AVL, in which there is uh, ST segment depressions are seen. And uh, here the left side ECG is not complete, and we are put upon a right side ECG but on right side ECG we can clearly see uh, in the right side V4, right side V5, right side V6 there is ST segment elevation denoting that the patient is having an RVMI especially since the right V4 is associated. Now posterior wall MI uh, right uh, like right sided MI there is a posterior wall MI also the there will be ST segment elevation in V7 to V6 when we switch the leads to the posterior aspect. Those are termed from V7, V8, V9 uh, till then. So, uh, ST segment elevation in V7 to V9 will be associated with that. Usually associated reciprocal ST segment depressions are seen in uh, V1, V2, V3 if there is posterior wall MI. Uh, relatively tall R waves may also appear in V1 and V3 with corresponding Q waves in the posterior leads. A lead AVR ST segment elevation uh, greater than or equal to the ST elevation in V1 may be useful in diagnosing acute left main coronary artery obstruction. That is a very important clinical uh, ECG criteria actually uh, AVR ST segment elevation but more than uh, the ST segment elevation associated with the V1 is what we are looking for uh, which may show say LMCA occlusion and mortality associated with this sign is very high since it's a left main occlusion and a diffuse ST segment depressions may be seen on other plates. Now in these two ECGs uh, this is a classical left side of ECG in here we can see that uh, there is ST segment elevation in lead 2, lead 3 and AVF. Uh, there is Q waves in lead 2, 3 AVF and uh, associated T wave inversion. So there is a classical ST segment elevation in the inferior leads. 2, 3 AVF inferior leads. We have the ST Q wave formation, ST elevation and uh, T wave inversion associated. And coming over to the uh, chest leads, we can clearly see that there is a tall T R waves, tall R waves, prominent R waves in V1 and V2, suggesting that there is a posterior infarct which may be uh, associated with this and uh, there is a T wave inversion in V4, V5 and V6 but there is no AVR ST elevation seen as such so we are not really suspecting a um, <coughs> um, LMC occlusion here but uh, since tall uh, R waves in V1, V2 and uh, T wave inversions in V4, V5, V6 lateral leads we are going to take a posterior ECG and the posterior ECG is showing similarly the 2-3 AVF ST segment elevation and associated uh, ST segment elevation in V6, V8, V9, uh, V7, V8, V9 of the posterior wall. One of the diagnostic dilemmas in diagnosing ST elevation MI is in left bundle branch block patients. In LBBB patients, we use something known as Scarbosa's criteria. So, Scarbosa's criteria is a set of rules which has values associated with them to diagnose in ST elevation MI in LBBB. The first rule is basically a ST segment elevation of more than 1 millimeter in the same direction of QRS. In any concordant leads, we take, give it a point of 5 following which the ST segment depression of more than 1 millimeter in any leads from V1 to V3, V1, V2, V3, we give it a score of 3 and ST segment elevation of 5 millimeter or more that is concordant with the QRS complex that um, we give it a, a score of 2. So any deep QS patterns or a small R with the deep S patterns associated with a uh, ST segment elevation of 5 millimeter or more, we get a, give it a score of 2. And when adding all these values, if the Scarbosa score is more than 3, it's highly specific, that is very few false positives. Uh, for diagnosing it as MI. But the problem here is it's very less sensitive. So it's highly specific but sensitivity sensitivity is a bit low. So one of the um, modifications that was brought to Scarbosa's criteria to improve its sensitivity is basically to um, 
change the third score that is the sc segment elevation of 5 mm or more which is discordant to qrs because in leads v1 and v2 there can be many reasons for a j point elevation as such so since those j point elevation can be due to like a left ventricular hypertrophy and all uh, what has been proposed is basically it's better to uh, take it as a ratio that is uh, the amount of st elevation divided by the amplitude of s wave so Um, so the amount of uh, ST elevation in millimeters we take it and uh, divide it by the amount of uh, amplitude of S wave in millimeters and if the ratio that we get is um, equal or more than 0.25 uh, we can say that it's highly specific for uh, ST elevation. So higher the ratio um, more uh, significant is the ST elevation. And uh, this thing, uh, this modification can improve Scarborough's criteria as sensitivity, and it's, it has been proposed to change to the third rule. Now, uh, what is the significance of Q waves in an ST elevation MI? Uh, first of all, uh, Q waves are not required for the diagnosis of MI. If it is there, it is Q is called as Q wave MI. If it is not there, it's called as non Q wave MI. That's it. Uh, but it's usually seen commonly during ST elevation MI rather than non-ST elevation MI. Its uh, Q wave size is more important, uh, which denotes the uh, size of infraction rather than the extent of infraction. So, um, rather than predicting whether it's submural or uh, pancardiac MI and all, it's more denoting the um, size, the total size of infraction rather than the depth or extent of infraction as such. Posterior lateral MI reciprocally increase R wave amplitudes in V1 and V2 without diagnostic Q waves. That's what initially we told uh, any inferior lead MI with the tall R waves in V1, V2, we should suspect posterior wall MI because Q waves are formed in the posterior wall, not in the anterior wall. So in anterior wall, we are seeing uh, tall R waves uh, like reciprocal changes. Now coming to the um, ST elevation in MI evolution, uh, basically how the ST segment changes happen in MI and how it evolves over time. Uh, normal, the, a, a normal T wave is basically a, a symmetrical T wave uh, with a, a upstroke which is slower than the downstroke. That's the normal T wave. Now, the first and foremost change that we may be able to see in a ST elevation MI is called as hyperacute T wave. This hyperacute T waves is like hypercalcemic T waves. It is tall, peaked, and symmetric, yeah, and lasts more on or for two or three contiguous leads. Now, uh, unlike hypercalcemic tall tender T waves, it won't be present in all leads of the ECG. It will be restricted to the leads that is affected due to the ischemia. Now, hyperacute T waves is very early sign, and uh, we may not be able to dictate it that fast unless the patient presents to us. Uh, initially, there will be uh, there will be an elevation of J point and the ST segment retains its concave configuration. But soon, ST segment will go into the convex or round upward uh, shape. Over time, ST elevation becomes more pronounced and uh, it changes morphology, becomes more convex, and then it merges with the T wave, becoming indistinguishable with the T wave. So the ST segment and T wave become indistinguishable and that pattern is known as tombstone pattern. Uh, the reciprocal ST segment depressions are usually observed in other leads by this time and uh, the ST segment uh, returns to baseline after certain days. Uh, in certain patients it can even range from 12 to 24 hours but in certain patients, most patients, it over uh, days, ST segment returns to baseline. Uh, the Q wave develops over time and there is a loss of R wave amplitude. Now, ST segment elevation persists for more than three weeks. We should suspect the underlying ventricular aneurysm. Uh, more than three weeks if ST segment uh, elevation persists. Now, T waves become inverted and it may remain inverted or it can become normal. Um, we can't predict that, but uh, it can go either way. And over time, there is continuous uh, continuous ECG changes and R wave amplitude becomes markedly reduced. Q waves will deepen and T wave can become inverted or um, remain positive. So basically, this helps us to identify whether a patient had a previous MI, especially if we, if we get a patient with uh, some 
uh, V1, V2, V3, a deep QS pattern uh, associated with a T wave inversion. We can think that if if no features of LBBB are not there, we can think that patient had a previous MI. Similarly, in you know, 1AVL, if there is a um, shortened R wave with a T wave inversion, we can think that previous MI had been there for the patient. Now, um, ECG evolution in NSME is not that drastic like what we see in ST elevation MI. Uh, the present uh, with ST segment depressions or T wave elevation two or more leads is what we usually get in ST uh, non ST elevation MI. And in ST segment elevation, which is sometimes subtle, should be sought in contralateral leads whenever ST segment depression is not up. So basically, what we are saying is that you, even though you get very prominent ST segment depression in con contiguous leads, you should not easily term it as non ST elevation MI. You should look for uh, a ST segment elevation in the opposite leads. Uh, so you get ST segment depression in 2, 3 AVF, that's good, but always look for a ST elevation in 1 AVL because you should not miss a ST segment elevation rather than diagnosing the patient to have non ST elevation. So make sure there is no ST segment elevations in the ECG before confirming it as non ST segment MI. The other manifestations of ischemia that can be seen in the ECG is uh, basically three. Uh, there can be pseudo normalization of T waves, which is um, very common. Uh, balance pattern is there and a Devender sign. Now, pseudo normalization of T waves is basically a patient whose baseline ECG already had some changes, uh, and the change was basically a inverted T wave, that is, negative T wave, and uh, it can become uh, pseudo normalization, that is positive uh, upright T wave during the time of a ischemia. And so this is a paradoxical T wave normalization during episodes of acute transmural ischemia. Pseudo normalization, it won't become normal as such, it's pseudo normalizations. Now, uh, valence pattern uh, is a pattern or, or as the left uh, um, LAD, uh, left candidate descending T wave inversion pattern is a deep coronary T wave inversions in multiple precordial leads. So there will be very deep uh, T wave inversion in multiple precordial leads uh, that is V1, V2, V3, V4 usually with or without cardiac enzyme elevation and with minimal or no ST elevations. So there may not be ST elevations associated with this but it will be very classical deep T wave inversions. It's usually caused by high grade stenosis in the left anterior dysentery coron uh, and left anterior descending coronary artery system. Uh, now, Devitter sign is basically upsloping ST segment uh, depression in leads V2 to V6. It's a upsloping ST segment depression in V2 to V6 in concert with a relatively tall and symmetrical T waves. Tall symmetrical T waves associated with upsloping ST segment depression uh, with loss of precordial R wave. So R wave should be minimized. That should be upsloping ST segment depression and tall T waves, symmetrical, tall symmetrical T waves in V2 to V6. The ST segment depression and T wave, uh, wave height are maximally seen in V3 lead. There may also be 1 to millimeter elevation in AVR. This has been associated with the occlusion of left anterior descending uh, artery. Now, uh, coming to presentation of acute coronary syndrome in an emergency room, when to suspect acute coronary syndrome? Any adult who presents to ER complaining of acute chest pain or dyspnea should be thought about as having ACS. Patients with prior history of ACS have significantly increased risk of recurrence. A prior history of other vascular diseases other than heart diseases itself has a high risk for cardiac ischemia. Um, and risk factors like elderly age, male sets, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, and most importantly, diabetes uh, should be thought about having high risk factors for developing a ACS. Recurrent use of cocaine or uh, methamphetamine can also uh, predispose a patient to have MI. And characteristic presentations uh, heighten concern, but always and always look for atypical symptoms. Now, in the history of presenting complaints uh, for a patient presenting with acute chest pain or chest discomfort, the things that we are going to uh, 
look into uh, basically are features of uh, ischemic pain uh, which is very distinguishable from non ischemic pain and the characteristics have been um, described below with a mnemonic of pqrst so uh, opqrst so in opqrst what o is basically for onset a typical ischemic cardiac chest pain is gradually in onset but intensity and discomfort may wax and wane so that means the patient may not have the same pain all over uh, the day or all over the time the pain's intensity can wax and wane but the pain will be gradual onset provocation palliation usually provocated by activity as we all suspect it may or may not respond to nitroglycerin nice and if improved it this may only be temporary if there is actual mi going on it only be temporary improvement if even if the patient has taken nitroglycerin uh, quality of the pain often characterized more as a discomfort rather than pain by the patients and difficulty for the patient to describe the patient can even put just put a um, like close fist over the uh, sternum of the chest and say that he is feeling something over there and that closed fist over the chest sign is known as Levine sign so uh, there are multiple terms that uh, patients usually uh, used to describe uh, a ischemic chest pain other than the word pain as a patient can say that they feel like skewing over the chest tightness like a bulge tightening over uh, their chest like a bra to, which is two feet um, it, it can be tightness pressure burning sensation retrosternal burning sensation they can um, complain about like a knot in the center of the chest a lump in the throat or a toothache especially that it's not very common but patient can complain to you with lower jaw toothache because the pain can get radiated to lower jaw usually not associated with upper jaw but lower jaw toothache can be a presentation of mi uh, then coming to radiation uh, the ischemic pain often radiates to other body parts especially the inferior uh, the medial aspect of left upper limb it can also radiate to both upper limbs shoulders abdomen or that is the epigastrium of abdomen uh, wrist fingers neck throat lower jaw and infrequently but it can also be radiated to the back especially in the interscapular region the site of the pain is very difficult to localize usually patient says a pain all over the chest rather than one pinpointed area and time course patients with ACS may have chest pain at rest or only during um, activity can also have rest pain and uh, usually usually the pain lasts more than 30 minutes so anginal pain usually lasts for 10 to 50 minutes this thing lasts longer than uh, usually more than 30 minutes and classical lead may or may not be associated with the improvement with the nitroglycerin Uh, now among these symptoms the most classical symptom that we have uh, learned about uh, ischemic chest pain is basically a retrosternal chest pain or heaviness associated with exertion um, forcing the patient to rest uh, with or without improvement and uh, causing radiation to bilateral upper limbs to the uh, neck as well as well as having the patient difficulty in breathing associated with diaphoresis and nausea this is a classical um, ischemic chest pain um, definition that or a description that we have studied about uh, this is very classical but uh, it doesn't mean that if it is not there the patient doesn't have MI as such so that's where we come to atypical symptoms so one third of patients might not have chest pain at all uh, on presentation to the hospital that has to be kept in mind they may not have chest pain at all these patients also often present with symptoms like a dyspnea just just dyspnea generalized weakness especially in females nausea and vomiting epigastric pain or discomfort palpitations syncope or cardiac arrest uh, sudden cardiac arrest can be due to acute mi and they are more likely to be older diabetic and women uh, this is an important implication for therapy and prognosis of the patient because these patients are much less likely to get diagnosed to have acute MI on presentation and since that initial diagnosis is getting delayed they are much less likely to receive appropriate medical therapy or thrombolytic therapy or even PCA for MI since that MI may not be considered as the primary diagnosis. Now coming to physical examination. Uh, examination of the patient in ER should always be depending upon the ABCD criteria. So once the ABCD is cleared off uh, from our side, the 
systemic examination that we are looking into basically sh should be focusing on uh, rapid triage of the patient and immediate diagnosis the ABCD approach has been done once ABCD approach has been done we are looking for basically features of cardiac failure like uh, pulmonary edema or cardiogenic shock we should in general examination look for pallor because anemia can worsen MI edema which features long-standing uh, cardiac failure uh, elevated JVP which shows that uh, there is a right-sided failure as well and bilateral crepitations of lung fields showing pulmonary edema which is a feature of left ventricular failure patient may have new onset murmurs or a S3 gallop rhythm on auscultation we can hear, uh, hear that and uh, rule out any associated acute neurological deficits because a acute neurological deficit is there it can be secondary to a thrombus formation which has gone to the systemic circulation or can be a hem hemorrhagic CVA uh, because for example for a, in a hypertensive emergency patient the hypertensive emergency can cause neurological features due to rise the uh, ICP secondary to intracranial hemorrhage due to the hypertensive emergency the same time the patient can go into a acute MI due to the hypertensive emergency so a neurological evaluation at the time of presentation is very much indicated uh, we don't have to do a full-on neurological examination but we have to rule out any focal neurological deficit because uh, if it is thrombotic we can treat it along with the uh, thrombolysis of MI but it is hemorrhagic it can impede the thrombolytic therapy for the patient now when to obtain the ECG all adult patients with chest discomfort that do not have any obvious known cardiac cause should get an ECG uh, it should be ob routinely obtained in adult patients or diabetic patients or a high risk patient who has high risk for ACS with the unknown et unclear etiology or with signs and symptoms consistent with arrhythmia. So usually, usually any patients over 30 with chest pain, any patient over 50 with a dyspnea, ultimate status, upper extremity pain, syncope or weakness and any patient over 80 with abdominal pain, nausea or vomiting. Uh, this is no like a hard and fast rule you need to understand that what we are uh, trying to say is keep an high index of suspicion for MI because it's very common and very uh, likely to be uh, presenting in a atypical pattern that's the only thing that we are seeing it's not like all, um, if a patient with uh, less than 80 years with abdominal pain or nausea and vomiting coming in should not take this is basically a clinical judgment so that clinical judgment should be kept in mind the initial ECG is not diagnostic uh, of MI if if that initial ECG you suspected MI you took the initial ECG but that's not showing any features that shouldn't rule out MI in fact if you think your clinical suspicion of ACS is very high the ECG should be repeated every 15 to 20 minutes to make sure you do not have a hyperacute changes in your hand now coming to investigations now uh, ACS is basically a clinical judgment and uh, with ECG um, investigations are not that uh, important role over here especially in ST elevation MI um, it plays an important role on non-ST elevation MI uh, because in non-ST elevation MI the ECG changes may not be apparent uh, acutely like in ST elevation MI or oh, and uh, non-ST elevation MI ECG changes can be due to some other causes also so uh, cardiac biomarkers that is uh, total CK, CKMB and uh, troponin I or troponin T that which you use uh, is the preferred blood test uh, of diagnostic evaluation the patients suspected MI and uh, it will be elevated in almost all cases the first one to elevate will be total CK, then CKMB and troponin IOT. Uh, since CKMB is non-specific, we can't use it at all. But CKMB elevations is a second in line. It can be elevated, but not only in MI, it can be elevated in other conditions like myocarditis, cardiac conditions, and also it's also not very specific. The specific one is trope or trop T. So any trope or trop T, which is elevated more than 99 percentile of the upper cutoff limit, we can take it as. A, diagnostic point for acute elevation MI keep in mind a cardiac enzyme which you send routinely uh, to rule out MI uh, coming back positive uh, is not the thing that we are saying that uh, if a cardiac enzyme is elevated it should be in a setting where there is a suspected myocardial injury secondary to uh, myocardial ischemia so there should be a uh, ischemic setting and that ischemia should cause myocardial cell death which causes the cardiac enzyme elevation so 
all cardiac enzyme elevation need not be treated as MI because uh, troponin I values can be affected with many other cardiac many other cardiac and non-cardiac conditions like a cardiogenic uh, shock, cardiac failure, SLE, sepsis, renal failure. So all these things can affect uh, troponin values. So just don't think that any elevated tropa is MI. You should suspect a ischemia and that ischemia should cause cardiac cell death. Uh, now along with the Troponin I, obviously if you are suspecting a ACS, you should draw blood for other investigation, especially a CBC to rule out anemia is because you need to, uh, anemia can worsen MI and if it is anemia worsening MI, you need to transfuse the patient if patient is not load, uh, overloaded. Renal function test is very important because uh, we need to know whether the renal function test will allow us to uh, take the patient for a uh, angiogram or a PCI. A PTI and RAPTT is also very important because we need to rule out a pair whether the patient is having a existing coagulopathy or the patient is on any anticoagulation, if the anticoagulation is there, what is the reference level? Now, coming to the management of a patient uh, who is presenting to emergency department with ACS, the management in emergency medicine should always depend on the ABCD approach and uh, the necessary intervention should be done parallelly. And the preliminary examination history and examination should be obtained as soon as possible and a totally DCG uh, should be interpreted within 10 to uh, um, within 10 minutes of patient's arrival. Uh, patient should be, if at all we are diagnosing the patient to have ACS, the patient should be kept in a very comfortable position, primarily in a head and elevation of 45 degrees. Resuscitation equipment should be available at the bedside ready for, um, with, along with the defibrillator because the patient may have arrhythmia and we may have to um, treat that being very fast. So, including a defibrillator, all emergency equipment, including airway equipment, should be available at the bedside. Cardiac monitor should be kept on the patient for a continuous monitoring, especially since the patient has a high risk chance of developing uh, arrhythmias, both uh, uh, tachyarrhythmias and uh, bradyarrhythmias. And uh, two IVHS lines should be available for the patient. Now, coming to the management of a patient with a, a myocardial infarction, the management of ST elevation MI in non-ST elevation MI differs slightly, but uh, majority of the uh, treatment points are uh, same only, which is being written over here. Uh, first of all, starting with oxygen. Uh, oxygen is required only if patient's saturation is less than 90 percentage. Uh, it should not be routinely given uh, because uh, uh, as we have been shown in uh, detox MI, uh, study which is a open label randomized trial which found that and there is no improvement in the endpoint outcome whether the patient was given extra oxygen in uh, ER or not. So um, routinely we don't have to give oxygen but uh, this rule has an exception. Oxygen can be given to a normoxic patient but who is in uh, cardiac failure. So any normoxic patient having ca acute cardiac failure we can give oxygen because to decrease the stress of the uh, myocardium but uh, in normal patients who is presenting with the MI unless their saturation is less than 90 percentage do not start on oxygen and even if you start on oxygen the target saturation should be uh, 94 percentage or uh, more 94 percentage that's the um, target saturation that you are looking for now coming to the second thing nitroglycerin nitroglycerin is very important because uh, it relieves the pain of the patient uh, so when the patient is having hypertension or if the patient is having pain, nitroglycerin should be started. Um, initial management can be nitroglycerin, 0.4 mg can be given sublingually, uh, which is very easy to give, the, give it to the patient by the time you are giving, uh, setting the IV sites. Uh, 0.4 mg, thrice you can repeat it, once uh, you repeat uh, three doses, make sure the patient's BP is not falling, there is no hypotension or significant BP drop is not there. If BP no, drop is not there and patient continues to be in pain, you can start NDG infusion at 5 microgram per minute uh, dosage. But uh, when you give nitroglycerin, make sure that you understand uh, the contraindications too. Uh, you should not give in a condition where there is shock or an impending shock. So um, make sure that the nitroglycerin that you give will not push the patient to shock or cause drastic fall in um, blood pressure because that itself is going to worsen the MI and uh, it is. Um, contraindicated in right ventricular MI and uh, in fixed output uh, conditions like a severe aortic stenosis. Now coming to morphine, morphine is uh, uh, indicated if the patient is having severe persistent pain in spite of the medicines that you gave, 
uh, but it's not routinely um, it's not routinely uh, recommended to give uh, now so morphine should be reserved to patients who is having severe persistent pain in spite of nitroglycerin and other pain medications that you give uh, if at all you are giving you can give 2 to 4 mg iv uh, stat dose followed by repeated doses with increments of 2 mg maximum up to around 8 to 10 mg you can give with increments uh, but uh, try to avoid it unless the patient is non responding to the medicines that you give uh, beta blockers uh, preferably cardio selective beta blockers like uh, um, atelol and metoprolol should be started within 24 hours of patient diagnosing to have MA oral tablets uh, but IV medicines can be given but it should be reserved for patients with uh, severe hypertension or with tachycardia. Tachycardia is the most important thing because uh, tachycardia itself will uh, cause decrease in diastolic uh, time for the heart. Uh, diastolic time is the time in which the cardiac circulation happens so more the tachycardia less diastolic time means less myocardial perfusion so in tachycardia patient is better to give IV beta blockers cardiosity beta blockers so that the tachycardia will come down and cardiac perfusion will improve and tachycardia itself will uh, increase the oxygen demand for the heart also right so uh, coming to uh, the basic uh, drugs that we give something known as loading dose so when we say loading dose, uh, that is three drugs. Basically, we are giving two antiplatelets and a statin, high dose statin. So the antiplatelets that we give, the one antiplatelets that we should give always is aspirin. And along with aspirin, we can give two more antiplatelets, two other antiplatelets, either one of the two other antiplatelets. Uh, which will depend on the management of the patient. So, uh, in ST elevation MI, in ST elevation MI, along with aspirin, we give a platelet P2 vital receptor blocker, which is clopidogrel, uh, if the patient is not being taken to PCI. So, if the patient is getting medical management or thrombol uh, fibrinolytic management, we can give clopidogrel. So, aspirin dose is 325 mg. Uh, what we have to understand here is aspirin is not. Uh, uh, echo spread we have to give aspirin itself which is chewable tablet we should ask the patient to chew the tablet and swallow uh, because then only uh, gastric absorption will happen very fast so aspirin 325 mg you can give with the clock girl 600 mg uh, per oral uh, if the patient is not going for pca but if the patient is going for pca in a st elevation mi the antiplatelet which should be added to aspirin uh, will be much much better aspirin that can uh, much better antiplatelet that can be added uh, will be a gp2b3a inhibitor which is tecagrelor so if you are giving tecagrelor along with aspirin tecagrelor's dose is 180 mg stat dose this is in ST elevation MI. Non ST elevation MI, you don't have to give tacagrelor. You can give aspirin along with the clopidogrel alone. Now, coming to statins, uh, the statin that we usually use is the atorvastatin with high dose, 80 mg per uh, dose. We are giving stat. Uh, this is the basic management. Now, coming to uh, transfusion criteria. Uh, when to transfuse a patient with MI? If the patient with MI has significant anemia, uh, and you think that anemia is worsening the patient's uh, presentation, you need to transfuse. A severe anemia that is a hemoglobin less than 8 mm, should require a transfusion and hemoglobin 8 to 10 uh, is there and patient is having ongoing ischemia is there, you can plan for a transfusion. But when you plan for transfusion, what you have to make sure is that uh, that transfusion will not fluid overload the patient and uh, you need to understand what is the LV capacity of that patient at that point you should get a uh, assessment of lv function then only transfuse the patient now coming to electrolytes uh, electrolyte correction is not in the mainstay of treatment but uh, it's always better to make sure the patient is not uh, having hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia it's better to correct potassium if it is less than um, 3.5 and magnesium if it is less than 1.8 Now, coming to the definitive management of ST elevation MI. Definitive, definitive management of ST elevation MI is always uh, PCA, percutaneous coronary angiogram with the angioplasty is the primary choice if high quality PCA is available. If primary PCA is not available on site, a rapid transfer to a PCA uh, center, available center 
will have a much better prognosis than using fibrinolytes but uh, the one thing that we have to make sure is the door to balloon time door to balloon time is the time in which patient comes to the initial hospital and the time to take the patient for pca should not be more than 90 minutes so if the patient comes to your hospital and your hospital do not have a pca uh, center and you are planning to send the patient to another hospital where pca is available that duration along with the time the patient will be taken to pca in that hospital should not exceed more than 90 minutes so if you have that option well and good send the patient for pca if that option is not there you should take fibrinolytics and if your if your management plan is to give fibrinolytics to the patient that should be given within 30 minutes of patients arrival to you to your hospital so uh, agent of uh, choice is always the rectiplase and tenecteplase which is much more better than alteplase which is better than streptokinase streptokinase being the least uh, active agent and uh, the um, outcome of streptokinase is not very predictable uh, so much more better are the uh, rtps uh, so uh, alteplase or rectiplase tenecteplase rectiplase and tenecteplase is preferred over alteplase because it's much more easier to give and lower doses is only required for example like rectiplase for 10 units alone is required uh, 10 units over 2 minutes and then I repeat 10 units bolus at 30 minutes that's it Tenecti place is weight based, so it has fixed dosages. We can refer that and give. Streptokinase, which is the most commonly available, cheaper also, uh, but um, not very potent. So, streptokinase, if you are giving streptokinase, it is 1.5 million units, that is 15 lakh units over uh, 30 to 60 minutes IV infusion, is what you give. For any patient, for any patient you are taking for fibrinolytic therapy, there is a bunch of absolute contraindication and relative contraindication that you have to look into. And uh, the absolute contraindications are very important to make sure that you don't take the wrong patient for fibrinolytic therapy. The first and foremost, uh, the patient who is planning for fibrinolytic therapy should not have any previous history of intracranial hemorrhage. The patient should not also have a ischemic CVA within last three months. Now, the ischemic CVA within last three months doesn't include a patient presenting with ACS and acute the CVA. Patient with the ACS and acute CVA can be taken for thrombolytic therapy because that thrombolytic therapy can uh, cure the CVA also. But uh, any previous any previous ischemic CVA within three months should be absolute contraindication. Similarly, any patient with a cerebrovascular malformations, AB malformations or intracranial primary malignancies or metastasis is absolute contraindication. Any patients with the symptoms suggestive of aortic dissection, symptoms or signs suggestive of aortic dissection is absolute contraindication. Any patient with a significant closed head or facial trauma within last three months is contraindicated. And lastly, any patient with a bleeding diathesis or a um, exception of uh, um, except menses if patient is having ongoing hemorrhage ongoing hemorrhage is there except menses or any patient who has a bleeding diathesis should not be taken for a fibrinolytic therapy now management of st elevation mi after fibrinolytic therapy uh, for pca for fibrinolytic therapy and for medical management you have to give anticoagulation that should be given as soon as possible for PCA, there is only an initial bolus dose required, an initial bolus dose of 50 to 70 units per kg. Uh, stat dose is given up to a maximum 7000 units. The idea is to achieve an activated clotting time of more than 200 seconds. Uh, but it is usually given just before patient is taken to PCA, um, not from ER as such. Uh, but during fibrinolytic therapy and uh, for patients with the only medical management, that is no PCA or fibrinolytic therapy, um, anticoagulation can be started from ER itself. Mm. So the dosage is 60 units per kg, IV bolus, maximum up to 4000 units, and then followed with a 12 units per kg per hour IV infusion. Uh, up to a maximum of 1000 units per hour to achieve a APTT level of 50 to 75 seconds. Now coming to management of definitive management of NCME. Definitive management of NCME doesn't include PCA, primary PCA or um, fibrinolytic therapy because there is still um, 
ongoing blood flow uh, to the heart. Uh, so there is no requirement of emergency fibrinolytics or PCI. But anticoagulation of non ST elevation MI patients from ER is an absolute indication. So, anticoagulants that we use here is either unfractionated heparin or anox heparin. Earlier in ST elevation MI, also, when we say the dosages, it's all unfractionated heparin. Uh, anox heparin is also can be used in uh, ST elevation MI. There's a loading dose for it, but uh, the dosages are a bit more uh, different or uh, complicated than unfractionated heparin. In non ST elevation MI, the two choices are still unfractionated heparin and anox heparin. If it, is, if it is unfractionated heparin, like in SE elevation MI, we are going to use 60 units per kg IV bolus, maximum up to 4000 to 5000 units, followed by 812 units per kg per hour IV infusion, maximum 1000 units per hour to achieve a PTT of 50 to 75 seconds. If you are using anode heparin, that is low molecular weight heparin, the good thing is there is no loading uh, dose. We are just going to give 1 mg per kg subcutaneously every 12 hours for patients with estimated creatine clearance uh, of more than 30. If the creatine clearance is less than 30, uh, we are going to give 1 mg per kg, kg subcutaneously every day. That is instead of BD dose, we will convert it to OD dose. Now, coming to the complication that can be caused by MI, the complications is usually uh, classified into mechanical complication and physiological complications. Now, coming to mechanical complications, um, there is no like a uh, increase in insulin center. Uh, mechanical complications can be acute MR if the papillary muscle necrosis is there due to the ischemia. Uh, left ventricular thrombus formation can be there, uh, interventricular septum rupture, left ventricular free wall rupture. And MI itself can cause pericardial effusion that may cause pericardial tamponade. Uh, not very common, but pericardial effusion is uh, possible in acute MI. Now, coming to physiolog physiological complications, uh, most of the physiological complications are acute complications due to the severe restricted uh, uh, cardiac function during uh, acute MI. Uh, one of the most common um, complications that we encounter is acute cardiac failure causing pulmonary edema and uh, it can lead to cardiogenic shock. MI patients are prone for developing uh, acute arrhythmias. It can be tachyarrhythmias, uh, including AF, SVT, uh, VT, all. But most commonly that we see is um, atrial ectopics or uh, ventricular uh, ectopics is what we see. But patients can also develop bradycardias, including heart blocks, especially if the right uh, coronary artery is involved. If the SA node supply is involved, we can get a um, bradyarrhythmia with the heart blocks also in those kind of patients. The patients with the acute MA can have pericarditis and uh, post cardiac injury that is Dressler syndrome is also possible. Now coming to acute decompensate cardiac failure, which is one of the most common complications that we see with the myocardial infarction. Uh, Basically, if the myocardial infarction is um, severe enough, which affects a large extent of left ventricular uh, function, left ventricular uh, heart wall, then it can affect the functioning of left ventricle and can cause the patient to go into acute decompensate cardiac failure. So, in those patients, uh, the Clinically, what we are going to see is uh, primarily features of pulmonary edema. So, the patient can have bilateral basic repetitions, breathing difficulty, desaturation. Those things we can see. The patient will also be having severe dyspnea, and uh, patient have a um, patient may progress to have a cardiogenic shock, hypotension, cold, clammy extremities, rapid thready pulse can be there. Uh, hypotension will be there. So, that is a classical clinical features that we see. It can be complicated with the associated right ventricular failure too, or the patients with MI can have a isolated RV failure also. So, if it is RV failure, usually RV failure without any associated pulmonary artery hypertension. Uh, if it's just the RV infarction causing failure, the treatment of choice is always uh, fluids. They give more fluids so that the patient's uh, preload to the uh, LV is maintained. Uh, that's the RV failure uh, treatment that we can give along with the uh, anotropic agents. Uh, but if it is LV failure, uh, the heart failure society of America has given up a set of guidelines. Basically, um, the guidelines is 
very large it's a huge uh, topic uh, acute cardiac failure is but the treatment goals in that uh, guideline uh, is what we have written over here so the treatment goals should be improve in congestion and low output conditions uh, low output condition symptoms so improve in congestion that is pulmonary congestion and low output symptoms that is symptoms of cardiac failure and uh, hypotension should be uh, treated so congestion improvement can be used with the diuretics uh, that is doses is basically uh, loop diuretic is what we use a uh, 20 to 40 mg iv uh, 40 20 to 40 mg iv bolus can be given to a patient who haven't uh, is not on any uh, loop diuretic before if patient is already on loop diuretics the bolus dose should be 2.5 times uh, higher than what the patient is getting daily uh, but there's a caveat we have to make sure that the patient is not in hypotension before giving bolus doses and once uh, the bolus dose has been given um, we can start the patient on iv infusions so when we start iv infusion of furosemide uh, 0.1 mg per uh, kg is the usual dose we can give we can titrate it up to 0.2 to 0.3 mg uh, per kg iv infusion uh, per hour uh, we can start the patient and uh, along with the diuretics we can uh, start the patient on inotropes when we start the patient on inotropes uh, that is to improve the cardiac functioning of the patient uh, noradrenaline is the anotrope of Joe is here uh, to start the patient and not at an alien, 0.1 microgram per kg per hour infusion can be started if at all the patient is in cardiogenic shock if the patient is not in cardiogenic shock we don't have to start uh, noradrenaline as such now even though noradrenaline is the first line drug that we start in uh, cardiogenic shock um, Dopamine uh, can be started or adrenaline can be started instead of noradrenaline, especially if the patient is having bradycardia associated with the hypotension. So if the patient is having a bradycardia hypotension, it's prudent to start the patient on either adrenaline or with uh, dopamine. Now, um, the second uh, thing that we have to uh, look into is optimization of the um, oxygenation of the patient. That is, make sure the patient's oxygenation is normal or near normal so all normotic uh, patients with acute cardiac failure can be started on uh, oxygen from er itself uh, even though patient uh, routinely we don't give for normotic patient with mi for the patient with normotia and with cardiac failure in mi can be started on oxygen but if the patient is having lv failure with the pulmonary edema the patient might be uh, require, might require a positive pressure ventilation so the positive pressure ventilation in acute lv failure um, uh, classically is uh, continuous positive airway pressure that is CPAP is the classical um, positive airway pressure device that we use uh, in LV failure induced pulmonary myeloma but we can use a Y11 positive pressure airway device also uh, basically uh, the primary choice in a positive airway pressure ventilation is uh, NAV non-invasive ventilation rather than an invasive ventilation that is rather than uh, ventilation in um, intubation mechanical uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation we should try the patient with uh, non-invasive ventilation first the things to make sure uh, things to consider the non-invasive ventilation is uh, epap that is a peep that we provide is the thing that is going to treat the patient of pulmonary edema symptoms and uh, improve the oxygenation and uh, decrease the work of breathing so we should start the patient on a, a higher epap than the you than usually that we start the patient on uh, usually the epap that we set is around five uh, but uh, in these conditions we may have to elevate it to seven to eight uh, PPAP, uh, epap that has to be given uh, if you are using cpap alone but if you are using uh, bipap uh, a cpap um, epap of around uh, six to eight uh, associated with a um, pressure support whatever pressure support you wish to give to decrease the work of breathing for the patient can be added as the ipap now when you give a non-invasive ventilation the one point that you have to make sure this the patient is fully conscious and is oriented and is obeying the commands given by you you should not put an NIV for a patient who is having ultra sensorium or decreased sensorium and more important if the patient is uh, having very much discomfort uh, in the NIV make sure to remove the NIV off because either uh, give mild sedation so that the patient gets uh, much more 
comfortable with the NIV or remove the NIV because uh, if the NIV patient is having severe difficulty in having the NIV or having dyssynergy with the NIV that is going to worsen the uh, patient's cardiac function and is going to worsen the cardiac failure and the So, uh, oxygenation, um, first thing is give oxygen in the ear for any heart failure patient. Second thing is if the patient has features of pulmonary edema, NIV is the primary choice for positive pressure ventilation. Uh, then if NIV fails, then we can think about intubation and mechanical ventilation. Uh, that's the oxygenation part. Now coming to optimization of volume status. As we have already told, diuretics is the first line of management followed by fluid restriction. Now, it's very important to identify the etiology and uh, address the precipitating factors which has caused the cardiac failure. In this case, most probably it is MI. If it is MI, the best thing to do is take the patient for PCA. Especially if it is ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation MI, early PCA will improve the cardiac status and cardiac functionality, uh, making the patient better from uh, cardiogenic shock and cardiac failure. So, uh, optimization of uh, uh, chronic oral therapy that is uh, diuretic therapy, uh, AC or ARV inhibitors, beta blockers and spinolactones are very important in managing the patient with the cardiac failure uh, for chronic improvement uh, and identification of patient who might benefit from revascularization as we, has, uh, as we have already told. MI patient present with acute cardiogenic shock or cardiac acute cardiac failure is an indication for taking the patient for PCA. And uh, if a uh, patient is already in severe cardiac failure, we should think about uh, uh, device therapies like intra-aortic balloon pump uh, to be given to uh, cause uh, to improve the cardiac functionality, to decrease cardiac workload and uh, improve the uh, High perfusion of the patient so that the patient can be taken for procedures and risk of arrhythmias should be kept in mind most one of the most common arrhythmias that can happen is atrial fibrillation uh, and if that in, in turn itself can cause thromboembolism and uh, the need for anticoagulation should be assessed in a patient to patient basis so with this we are coming to uh, the end of this uh, topic i hope you got an idea about acute myocardial infarction and uh, how to go about managing a patient with MI. Thank you.